All right, we're live, I guess. Happy Friday, and welcome back to another exciting episode of Get Your Tech On, our show on all things Doxis. I'm your host, Brady Volp, founder of Nimble This and The Volp Firm. Our show today is a Did You Know session where we cover multiple topics related to the world of cable and Doxis. So buckle up and get ready to have your mind blown. And of course, we want to hear from you. Don't be shy. Drop your questions in the chat window, and we'll do our best to answer them. But please... Do not wait until the very last minute, or we may not have enough time to cover all your questions. We're not miracle workers, folks. All right, so let's get this show started. Our guest today needs no introduction. He's been on the show before. He wowed us with his impressive feats of strength and intelligence, and now he's back for more. So let's give him a warm welcome, the one, the only, John Downey. John, welcome back. How are you doing, my friend? You need, you need like background clapping or applause. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <laughs> <laughs> I've only been on a couple times, right? <laughs> Just once or twice, yeah. Over eighty-nine. This is our eighty-ninth episode, John. So I, I would say this is your eighty-ninth time joining us. Yeah. So. <laughs> it just seems like yesterday. <laughs> just, just yesterday, yes. <laughs> so how are you doing, John? Where are you broadcasting yeah, from today? Yeah, I tell you what, I'm in Raleigh Durham area, out west of Raleigh Durham, Durham, and uh, it's eighty, like eighty. Well, 70 some degrees, but it's nice and sunny and it feels a lot warmer. It's the same here in Atlanta. We're, we're at, uh, oh, let's see, we're at uh, 70, 72 degrees right near now in Atlanta, which you can't say for the rest of the country. <laughs> I know. It's uh, no wonder everyone's getting sick. <laughs> it's like cold one day and it's hot the next day. It's like, wow, the things are crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, John, I thought I'd start us off with um, a question from one of our listeners, and I haven't given you any of the details on this in advance, so let's see if I can stump you with this one. Um, this one comes from Dawn, uh, and Dawn writes, Hi, I came across your YouTube channel, and I'm learning so much. I work for, I work for an ISP, and I have a question to ask you. If a customer has an XB6 modem, and they are subscribed to 500 megabits per second, and they live in an MDU, a multi-dwelling unit or apartment building. Let's say um, they're on the 20th floor and the building is running RG59 cable. Then they call to upgrade their speed uh, to 1.5 gigabits per second on the XB6. They're not getting the speed when they run the speed test. Is it the RG59 cable that won't give them that speed, or is it the XB6 modem that won't support the speed? Thank you, Dawn. It's the answer is probably yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> <laughs> right, all of the above. Uh, Ron, if you're out there, it depends. <laughs> it depends. It depends. That's the answer. You know, the modem itself, I I suspect only has a one gig port. You know, a one gigabit Ethernet port will only put out about 960 megabits per second. You'll never get one gig from one gig port. The newer modems are actually putting out 2.5 gig ports. Now, with that said, when you're trying to do a speed test, that's one service flow, that's one PC on one port. If you sign up for 1.5 gig, in theory, you could probably get that through your house, but you'd have to use multiple ports. Correct. You know, you'd have one PC on a port, you'd have your kids gaming on another port, you're doing over the top video on another port. So you could have 1.5 gig aggregate through your house, but not on a single flow. Not yet. Not not to one PC. You can't get one. Right. Like if you're doing trying to do a speed test from one PC, you're not going to get 1.5 gigabits per second. But even, even, all even the users. The modem. Even a new modem with 2.5 gig port, the PC might not have a super high port, right? It, <laughs> it might be a one gig port on the PC. Yeah. So, so actually, just like some of the, some of the net latest computers coming out, like the the brand new Mac computers with the M1 processor, the M2 processor, they are coming out with 10 gigabit connect or Ethernet ports on them. But yeah. these are like the latest greatest machines coming out. If you have an older computer or even you know computer that's maybe a year old. It only has a one gigabit connection on it, and and to your point, John, like a a one gigabit Ethernet port. So so you said like that maximum speed of nine hundred and seventy four megabits per second. Yes, you're only yes. going to get that if you're transmitting fifteen eighteen byte frames, like the optimal yes. frames for an Ethernet yes. connection. If exactly. you're transmitting tiny frames, like sixty four kilobit frames, you're going to get way less like, than nine hundred. That maximum nine hundred and seventy four megabits per second. Yes. Um, so you're going to have much less than that. Yeah. 
you know, smaller the frame size, more overhead. So whenever you, if you can do the biggest 15, 18 byte ethernet frame, that's the way to test. If you can test UDP versus TCP, that's the way to eliminate the upstream downstream uh, coexistence uh, and, and cross referencing. Um, UDP would be a one way test and that's much better to baseline. Um, and then some PCs don't even have connectors anymore. They're all Wi-Fi. It's all Wi-Fi, you know? exactly. So, and you got to worry about what type of Wi-Fi you got to see if it can handle the speed test you're trying to do. And if you're trying to do a VPN, there's even more encapsulation from the VPN. More overhead. So, yeah. so yeah. I think these are these are all good points. Um, so I think Don, this is a great question to to uh, really bring up, especially you know we're really in a new time when we're we're looking at giving subscribers a gigabit per second or even one and a half gigabit per second, these high speeds, we have to think about more things than just the raw throughput of that. Like John, you said, the computer may not support it. The modems ethernet may not support it. Um, that RG59 cable may be a limitation because maybe it can't support the higher order, order modulations or even higher frequencies. So there's a lot of there's a lot of variables, a lot of like, it depends that may be going on there. So great question. Lots of things that we have to keep um, in consideration on. Um, so it looks like we got some questions in the chat. Uh, Jason, great to see you on. Uh, what am I ever going to do with 10 gigabits per second on my laptop? I think that's a great question. Um, but, that's you know, a question we... not for him. That's not for him, that's for his kids. <laughs> yeah, his I mean, kids we can figure out how to use it. We, we keep seeing more and more content, uh, things that you need to move back and forth. But if you want to be able to test 1.5 gigabit per second, you have to have an Ethernet connector, connect and connector on your laptop, maybe for a technician that has to do that type of throughput testing to say, can my modem support it? So you know maybe that's yeah. one use, Jason. Uh, LC is saying, John is correct. XB6 can only carry one gig. XB7 or XB8 are capable, and, and so that is a good good point. Like John, like you're saying, some of the newer modems can have 2.5 gig connectors on it, and they could support that 1.5. Um, and uh, oh, hey, Don, Don joined the conversation. Don, <laughs> welcome to the room. So Don is the one who uh, uh, sent us the the uh, question. So Don, glad we could answer your question. So. Please, you know, do if anyone does want to send us a question, you can send that to info at volpfirm.com and uh, we'll, ha we'll be happy to answer questions online. So uh, that being said, John, I, I know we, you know, the, the, the content of this show is, uh, did you know? So, John, I'm going to throw it back to you and, and say, uh, what do you want to share? What knowledge do you want to drop on us today with did All you right, know? All right, so I, I did see that you... Um broadcast or announce that you're going to have a, uh, a podcast with Ron, right? Yes. Is it next month? Ne next weeks? week, next Friday. Next week on DB, DBMV. Yes. On signal uh, levels. RF. So I thought that was a good one too, because I'm, it's one of my pet peeves of, you know, using crop proper uh, initialisms, uh, acronyms. There's a difference between those words too, right? Initialisms and acronyms. An acronym means it spells out a, a word like DOCSIS is an acronym. Or laser cable service interface spec, yeah. right? So DOCSIS is a is a is an acronym. Um, there's other ways of memorying remembering things. They're called mnemonics, like DORA. DORA is Discover, Offer, Request, Acknowledge. The four steps of the DHCP process. Yeah. Um, so there's there's things that I help you remember uh, color codes and and uh, the right hand rule for current flows in the right hand, and it creates a magnetic field of flux that flows this way. Uh, you know, through so the right-hand role of current flow uh, as electrical engineer. And I know you got a BSE also, right? Did you get a master's or no? I have a, yeah, I have a master's in electrical engineering. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dan. Lottie now. <laughs> uh, so, we, and you got Penn State as well, right? Yeah, yeah, well, Penn State for my undergrad and John Johns Hopkins for my graduate. Yeah. Yeah, I got the BSE from Penn State and that was enough. And I just wanted to make money after that. <laughs> <laughs> but it, you learn all these ways of memorizing certain things and, and, when you start writing documents, you want to make sure you're using proper terminology. Uh, even when you're talking to someone, like I would never say I have 51 dB of signal. That doesn't make sense. It's sort of a mean, it, it doesn't have any meaning to it because exactly. it's, it's an... when you talk about levels, there has to be a reference. Right. Like if I'm talking about optical power, I would say dBm. It's weird too, right? Because dBm you would think should be dBmW because <laughs> it's reference to a milliwatt. Right. But we just label it DBM. 
And then the other thing is like, what is capitalized and what isn't capitalized? Well, Dessa Bell, Bell was Alexander Graham Bell. So we kind of give him honor by capitalizing the B. It's also, it's, it's a person's it's name. It's a person's yeah. name. So that's why we're capitalizing exactly. the B in the decimal. Yeah, Voltaire, the, the guy invented voltage or whatever. Uh, we do a capital V for, so you might say uh, 55 volts AC, the V is capital, but the AC is small. Right. Because AC is this alternating current. It's not someone's name. Uh, DBMV, small D, because it's deca, one-tenth of, of the unit. Mm -hmm. um, so decibel, B is capital B. Millivolt, milla is one thousandth, right? So small M and V is capital for the guy's name. Uh, so you, you know what's supposed to be capital, what isn't. If I'm talking about losses uh, and gain, it's a reference to itself. Like it's a ratio. So it's just dB. Yeah. But if you're talking about levels, whether it's optical levels, RF, voltage levels, it has to be referenced to something. So you'd be dBmV, dBm. Another one you might see in Europe is dB mu V, which is really a U, uh, for microvolts. And there's the, the quick translation error, it's just this uh, difference of 60. So if I have, uh, what, 60 microvolts, dB mu V, that's the equivalent of zero dBmV. I think that's correct. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting, John, because I have to say, I've been writing DBMV, megahertz, kilohertz, and now that, but I've, I've always learned to write these just because that's the way you're supposed to do it. I honestly have never thought that I've been writing decibel um, because yeah. bell is the, is, is a person's name and I, you yeah. write the capital B yeah. until you just said this now, like, holy cow, I've been in cable for 30 years <laughs> and, and, and I never really thought about, well, why is the D little and the B is capital and the M is little and the V is capital, but it all makes complete now sense proving now. proving everyone that we don't rehearse any of this stuff. I know. <laughs> we never rehearse. I know, mega but I'm, I'm glad you dropped this knowledge on me because I, I actually, I learned something today. <laughs> like mega, mega is uh, 10 to the sixth power. So it's, it's, it's not, it's not a tenth or one hundredth. It's above, right? So mega is a capital M, uh, and Hertz was a guy's name. So you just capitalize the H, not the Z. I, um, so, so I think the reason we probably capitalize the mega is because we also have milla. We have like millivolts and mega. Oh, no, no. What I'm saying is, if you have the unit of measure and you go below minus ten to the minus one, ten to the minus two, ten to the minus three, it's a small case. Right. If it's ten to the positive one, it's cent. Uh, uh, um, deca. Kilo. Mega, giga, all of those are above the unit measure, right? 10 to the first power, 10 to the second power, 10 to the third power. Those would be capitalized. The right. only one that's actually an oddball, it doesn't fit in there. Is killer. Killer. Kilohertz. We killer. always keep the K small. And yes. I, I, I was going to ask about that because I, I know they all, we always have a small K in kilohertz. What my understanding is the capital K is being reserved for Kelvin. Oh yeah, that would that would absolutely make sense. So Kelvin yeah. degree of temperature, yeah. Kelvin yeah. Celsius Fahrenheit, and yes. I think all of those are also um, capitalized. But those I think are after names. Uh, yeah, maybe. I'm not I sure see. about that. I think you have to look into yeah. that. One. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, I think like, you're right. Kelvin is definitely always capitalized. Yeah, this would make for a good trivia game, right? We could make a cable <laughs> trivia game, and uh, and and that would be some of the stuff that would be in it. Uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting. Is is uh, Understanding the proper usage of dBmV, dBm, dBmUV, kilohertz, megahertz, uh, pico would be a small p because pico is 10 to the minus 12, I think, right? Right. Um, yeah. Zeta is capital Z. Zeta is 10 to the 12th power, I think. It's something way up there. You know, we have gigahertz, we got gigabit per second, terabit per second, and then we're looking at Zeta or Zena, whatever. I mean, it's, it keeps going further and further out. Right. So that's, that's one of the things I was talking about. The other one was, um, did you know, this, this is a mind blower, uh, that the signal through fiber is slower than the signal through coax? Yeah, that's shocking, Everyone isn't thinks, it? It is. Because you're you going to think that all oh, fiber's got to be yeah. faster than cable. Yeah. We can get more speed out of fiber, and fiber has so many advantages. It's not affected by temperature. It's not really, a, it doesn't have that slope problem. Uh, at you know different frequencies, different losses because we're sending one maybe one wavelength. I mean, we are might be sending multiple wavelengths, but that one wavelength of light could be carrying all kinds of RF signals on that wavelength. Um, but the actual 
index of refraction of fiber is usually like 0.67, whereas the velocity of propagation through coax is could be 0 0.9, 0 0.88, uh, 0.92. You think about what coax is, and what does coax mean? A lot of people might think coax means two conductors, but it would be called biax if it was two conductors, right? Mm -hmm. Because bi means two. Co means coexisting. So it's like coax means it's sharing an axis. It's coaxial. So you're sharing one axis for two conductors. So that axis the being the conductor. center conductor, you mean? Yeah. So that you have the center conductor, and then the outer conductor is holding the signal in. So between the center conductor and outer conductor, really it's a waveguide. Right. That signal is traveling. What's the only thing holding that signal back? The dielectric. Right. That the shielding. That, the outer, well, the, and the shielding. Yeah. But the shielding is helping it not go out, right? Right. So it's holding it in. But the dielectric is what's slowing it down. It has to go through the dielectric, the signal. So if I look at glass being dense, but dielectric is foam, that would be like it's not as much of an impediment for the signal to go through that waveguide. And this gets so, into the velocity of propagation, right? Where we exactly. use that velocity exactly. of propagation term. Exactly. So when we look at delay or latency, there's more latency and delay in fiber than there is in coax but we can't go very far distance in coax because the losses of coax. Right. Whereas fiber, we can go miles and miles and kilometers and whatever you want to, you know. But when, when we're, you know, we're really talking about what is the difference between uh, the impact of that delay between fiber and coax, it's, it's really, really tiny. I mean, you're not yeah. going to notice the difference uh, if you're an end user when you're, when we're talking about things like delay and jitter and things like that, you're not going to notice it if you're on fiber versus coax. Correct. It's like, like nano, nano seconds. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We measure j jitter in, in terms of uh, uh, microseconds or milliseconds. Um, and you're talking about the differences of, of nanoseconds yeah. or even less. And, and, and where we start maybe seeing that uh, creep up would be when we start doing uh, uh, distributed access architectures where it's digital fiber and we can uh, go farther and farther, like a thousand miles. Right now it's going to add up. Right. You know, when I had satellite, satellite <laughs> internet access, oh, know, that was I, was so painful. 20, I was going 22,000 miles to the, 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 uh, the, the, the satellite above the equator, right? <laughs> That's geosynchronous. And, uh, that delay is pretty significant. Right. <laughs> oh man. I think I would talk and you see my lips move three seconds after I was talking or something. Yeah, I mean, we would be done with the live stream sometimes, and I think you were still talking. So. <laughs> <laughs> it was painful, yeah. <laughs> it was painful. It was painful for me, too. So I, th I thought that was kind of is a couple of good things to talk about was uh, uh, the reference of DBMV, DBM, the reference to levels, um, understanding uh, fiber versus coax. Uh, what about temperature, you know? Temperature, the rule of thumb was, I believe, uh, I had it written down, um, for every 10 degree delta from, say, 68 or 70, it's a 1% one, 1 or 2% change. In the attenuation. Yeah, in the attenuation. Uh, so the, the higher the temperature cycle. and the higher the frequency, which means as you more attenuation, that percentage of a bigger number becomes a bigger number. So 1% of 1 dB, what is that, 0.01? <laughs> but if you were losing 20 dB of signal level at 750 megahertz, 1% of 20 dB is what, uh, 0.2? It's not very 1%. much. I think it's like 2%, isn't it? I'll have to look again. Yeah, but I, th I, I think you're, you know, so if you live in sort of a temperate climate, um, big sweat, you know, you don't see that big swings in temperature. But for people who live, uh, you know, particularly in the north, where you can have a day where, you know, one day it could be maybe, you know, minus 10 degrees and it could warm up to say 70 degrees. Yeah. These rapid swings in temperature can have a dramatic change in the signal receive level or signal transmit level of your cable modem. Um, and there's other things that can happen as well in a cable plant. But to your point, these can have dramatic impacts to a subscriber's quality of experience with, with their modem if the plant is not tight, if it's not well-maintained. And particularly, and I see this more and more, where um, people are saying they do not have their automatic gain control or automatic level control enabled in their amplifiers. 
And that's really, really important to compensate for these changes in um, attenuation that you're talking about for coax. Agreed. Agreed. I mean, we don't have much in regards to upstream and reverse path, but uh, some of the amplifiers might have uh, thermal equalizers where the equalizer, the reverse EQ can manipulate its tilt a little bit depending on the temperature. Now, granted, you're looking at temperature inside of the housing, <laughs> but if the outside gets hotter, then it might get hotter inside and the thermal EQ can kind of adjust its tilt. Yep. So maybe sometimes something's better than nothing. You know? Yes. Yeah, we do have long loop level control with the modem and the CMTS that if the levels change, they'll communicate with their station maintenance and they'll readjust its level. But you only have so much window there you can deal with. Absolutely. It has its limitations. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think that understanding the temperature effects uh, bodes well. Knowing that we're going to increase our upstream to maybe two, 204 megahertz. Now there's more loss at 204. There's going to be more of a temperature swing at 204. Um, so that's something good to know about. The other thing is like, did you know, uh, black jacketed aerial cable rule of thumb is 40 degrees above ambient temperature when the sun is loading on it, which yes. makes sense. Sun black loading is a problem. Fucking more radiation heat. Yeah. Cause I, I know, um, and it's been a while, but, uh, when all of us worked at C-Corp many years yes. ago, um, we were coming out with some new equipment and particularly fiber nodes that were consuming a lot of power. And we started to paint the, them white uh, in order to minimize the sun loading impact on it. And I know that did have some improvement on, on sun loading. Um, so definitely to your point, so black jacketed cable for anyone who's not familiar with that, it, it is coax cable, above ground aerial coax cable that has a, uh, it's, it's not, it's not right. It's a plastic kick, um, protective outer covering on the cable that's black and it absorbs more heat obviously black tends to yeah. absorb light white tends to repel light yeah. that's why it's white um yeah. but that absorption of heat in the into that coax cable heats the cable even more so what john is talking about as that sun loading comes down we're going to absorb more heat into that cable and that's going to have more attenuation on it so it even exasperates the fact of solar loading so something to keep in mind um, when you're looking at what cable you're going to purchase or even what equipment you're going to purchase and um, install out into the field. Yeah, you remind me of, you know, the, of, of going with maybe a, a white powder coat or white painted uh, enamel type of finish on the nodes or whatever. But then we also, uh, many manufacturers started making the heat fins kind of diagonal. That way, if you mounted it certain, like this way or this way, it wouldn't matter. But if the heat fins were meant that the, were mounted a certain way, heat rises through the fins. Right. So if you mount it the wrong way, those fins would trap the heat in. By making the fins kind of diagonal, it wouldn't matter which way you mounted the housing. Correct. And the heat could still find a yeah. channel to go up through. Yeah, so in heat, hot environments, uh, and a lot of us live in hot environments, that is really important to consider. So if you're a technician and you're installing an amplifier, there are manufacturer's guidelines on the correct installation of that amplifier. And it's not just for convenience, but it is because thermal dynamics are at play and getting heat away from the amplifier is really important for the performance of that amplifier at high temperatures. It reduces your distortions. It improves the gain of the amplifier. A lot of things go into that design. The mechan mechanical engineers really, really understand this. And they spend a lot of time modeling and designing the ampli amplifiers, particularly for when that amplifier is in a hot climate. Um, so John, I just want to break. We got some uh, good questions and, and, and uh, discussions in the chat room here. Don came back and he said he had some additional questions. If someone has an XP6 or S XP7 modem, they have an XIT-T or IPTV box beside it. And he was told that they should be connected to each other via Ethernet. Why is this? Thank you again. Juan came back and he says that frees up Wi-Fi broadband, but since it's close, um, might as well plug it in. I completely agree with Juan on this, um, and I, I think there's multiple things that go on there. Anytime you have an Ethernet connection, that's that's going to give you a better connection than Wi-Fi. But I think he has a good point there. When you are transmitting video from one device to another, video can have reasonable amount of uh, consumption. So you do want to have um, 
sort of that, you know, having that Ethernet connection there means you're not taking away anything from the Wi-Fi. Um, so, John, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that. No, I, I, I agree. I mean, Wi-Fi is a matter of convenience. Um, but if you have an Ethernet cable and it's close enough, why not yeah. use it? I mean, anytime someone asks you to do a speed test, they're going to say, hook up a wire. Yes. You know, hook up a wire, eliminate all the variables, and let's see what the speed is without Wi-Fi, without VPN, without uh, any other things that are going to mess it up. I mean, just because it's Wi-Fi doesn't mean there's not interference. I mean, if it's 2.4 gigahertz, heck, you could be interfering with your neighbor's 2.4 gig. You know, microwaves are 2.4 gigahertz. If you try to do 5G, well, 5 gigahertz isn't going to go through the walls as easily as 2.4 gigahertz. So now all of a sudden you could have problems with uh, the walls or line of sight, not really line of sight, but you understand like impedance from, from the stuff in your house. Yep, I remember absolutely. back in the day, like be careful of houses with uh, stucco because a lot of the houses with stucco had chicken chicken wire <laughs> and then they would stucco it. Well, that chicken wire really is a Faraday cage. So you're not really getting very signal through that Faraday cage. Maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, no, so, so I think, you know, it's like, so Don, you could be you could be hooking up your your XB modem and and that IPTV box, and while you're there, picture quality looks outstanding. But you leave, and you know, as John's mentioning, someone turns on a microwave, and now you you have some micro macro blocking or some pixelization, and that's going to have that customer start to generate a CSR call, and you're going to end up back at that customer's house. So taking that extra few minutes to hook up that Ethernet cable means that you're going to have consistent, reliable video quality for that subscriber. And it's going to prevent you from having to come back to that subscriber's house to try to troubleshoot something that's going to be difficult to troubleshoot, like these Wi-Fi interference issues that John is talking about. So that Cat5 cable is going to save you an unnecessary truck roll back to that subscriber's house and save that subscriber unnecessary quality of service issues. So it's really, really worth it to put that in. So I think that was a great recommendation from Juan as to why we should do that. Um, I think and we have some other a, comments. Here. Oh, let's, John. Throw a negative, let's, throw a, let's throw a negative on top of that. Remember back in the day, and it, it, it still happens, the three different types of Ethernet cables. You know, we say it's an RJ45 jack. RJ11 would be for telephone. Mm -hmm. RJ45 is what we use for Ethernet. But then there's a rollover cable there's a straight cable and then there's a crossover, crossover cable. cable. Yes. So you can end up grabbing the wrong style. And unless you put the two heads together and look to see the color is the same. Um, but it's not going to work. If you put the wrong cable in, it's not going to work. You're going to, you're going to know that right away. You're going to troubleshoot it. And before you yeah. leave, you're going to fix it. Ideally. The good, thing, the good thing is most of the equipment you're plugging into has LEDs. Yes. That shows that it's actually connected or it's transmitting and, and blinking. Right. And a lot of the newer equipment is even auto detecting, auto sensing. Yeah. So even if you put a crossover cable, it, a lot of times it'll it'll be able to auto detect that and right. even yeah. work with the crossover hub. cable. You had a stupid hub, and and you did, and the hub had one special <laughs> connector just for the, yeah. the interconnect. But now there's like it just auto detects, like you said, and can figure out how to do it. And I'm like, yeah, things are much simpler and easier than it used to be. I was going to say, we're old. We're just showing our age with the equipment we used to work with. Because as a system employee, <laughs> the crossover cable is what we use for console cables. Yes. So we had to have a crossover cable so that the pinout was a little bit different than a, not a crossover, a rollover. It was called a rollover yeah. cable. Yeah. Most people, fortunately, do not have to deal with these things anymore. It's just <laughs> all, you know, it's all plug and play. Um, yeah, so, yeah. so, Don, you're welcome. Appreciate uh, appreciate your questions. Keep them coming, Don and Jason. Uh, thanks. Done that a couple of times. Sometimes a device on the other end detects and fixes. Good point, Jason. So thank you. Uh, thanks for the chat room. Keep the questions coming. Uh, so John, what is next? I got I got another one for you. All right. Why well, one? What is the characteristic impedance of coax? Seventy five ohms. Why? Why do we use 75 ohms? So, you know, I did read one time. So most other industries use 50 ohm impedance. And, and I believe that's because they typically have higher current carrying capacity than what the cable industry has. I believe, from my understanding, we use 75 ohms because it's more optimal for lower current, but a, a little higher voltage. But um, I'd be interested... You're gonna. I think you're gonna tell me precisely yeah, yeah, yeah. what the answer so, is. So, so I remember like going looking over the graphs and stuff, and it showed what is the best characteristic impedance for what we do for RF, transport RF, frequencies we have, 
it, you know, we're talking DBMV, which is reference to a millivolt. So it's really low voltage, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it turned out, I believe the real number is 76.6. The optimum number is like 76.6, but we say 75, we just, everything's 75. So, so, so it, is the is the impedance yeah. really seventy six point six, and we just say seventy five, or is the I, character's impedance really seventy five ohms? I think it's really seventy five, but the optimum, according to mathematics, is seventy six point six. Right, it was okay. something of that nature. Uh, but the other one was, yeah, a lot of test equipment would use fifty ohm. Remember, the, like the old uh, HP seventy five. Oh. Every piece like of that? equipment we used to work with at C Core was. 50 ohm 50 equipment ohm. and we had to put 50 ohm to 75 adapt 75 ohm yeah. adapters on it because they didn't make yeah. really any 75 ohm you the matching pad you forgot to add 5.7 db or whatever yeah. it was it a, a matching uh a type, some type of matching resistance or whatever yeah um but yeah the, it's supposed to be better suited for test equipment and i think for power or voltage i thought what's interesting is look at one other impedance which is better for i think might be for current is 30 ohms and if you look at a coax we came out with in the industry when we started looking at centralized powering remember when we looked at centralized powering like a big old battery backup and Huge. generator and then yes. we would send on a special cable to all the different nodes yep so we didn't put a smaller power pack at each node we were thinking about one big one and that cable was called pf625 power yeah. power feeder 625 so the size was 625 but if you ever cut it open, the center conductor was flipping huge. And it turned out it was 30 ohms. So it was wow. meant specifically just for power. So I, I thought that was kind that. of interesting. Yeah. We made, or Comscope made a special coax just for that power transformation, you know, tra power transfer. But that's very God interesting. Forbid it, try to use it for RF. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, if, if, but if, we had, yeah, if we had lots of it out there, someone would use it for RF. I am yeah. certain of well, that. <laughs> if it was out there today, someone would be ripping it off the pole and selling all the copper. Yeah, oh, yes, definitely. <laughs> That's a lot of copper then, in that. And there's another trivia thing, right? How much really is copper? Well, because of the skin effect of RF, we know all the frequencies are on the skin of that center conductor. Mm -hmm. So we only have like a little, a, a little, what do you call it? A film of copper on uh, uh, aluminum for hardline cable. Mm -hmm. It's copper on top of stainless or on it's copper. Steel, we call it copper clad, right? Copper clad, but it's clad over top of aluminum, right? Yeah. For for hardline coax, for drop cable that is, I think, steel. The center conductor is not aluminum. It's a it's hard, right? Uh, it's copper clad steel, I think, or something to that nature. Um, but it's it's interesting to understand the impedance, uh, why we use what we use because it it has less loss for the frequencies we use. Uh, understanding skin effect and you don't want to nick the copper yeah. off of that when you're because now you might you might there goes 750 megahertz there goes yeah, so, <laughs> exactly and i think that's why like for, for any of the technicians who've been in any, any of the like cable tech games or anything like that or have gone through any training proper training on how to connectorize a cable whether that's a drop cable or a mainline cable everyone stresses all the trainers stress how important it is to not nick, or especially when you're coring the cable or you're stripping the cable, you do be want to be very, very careful not to nick the center conductor. And and John, you really described it well because it's it's just a thin conduct outer layer of copper until you get down to either the steel or the aluminum center of that. And if you yeah. nick that copper, you're really destroying the most important part. Of that connector, that coax. Take, that's, how many nicks does it take to get to the center of a tootsie pop? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me see. <laughs> One, two, <laughs> three. That's it. <laughs> so so I, I, I think that's kind of interesting to understand that, that skin effect. And if we know the higher frequencies ride on the skin of the center conductor, the outer, where does 60 hertz voltage ride? 60 hmm. hertz. Is a lot lower than megahertz. Yes. Even the lowest frequency we use is five megahertz, but 60 hertz, that's right through the whole center conductor. So if it's copper clad steel in a drop line, that's not going to be a very good conductor for electricity. Like if you're right. trying to power through the drop to an ONU or something like that. Uh, if we're running power through aluminum, not so bad. I mean, it'd probably run better through pure copper, but we can't afford it. <laughs> pure yeah. copper center conductor would be huge cost. And, 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 
And on a drop, we don't have to worry about that because we don't, well, in, in most cases, yeah, we are not running power. power from a drop right. down to a subscriber's home. We absolutely should not be doing that. Correct, correct. <laughs> Inadvertently, we might be. <laughs> it happens on <laughs> occasion, like but it's, it's a bad like thing when it does loop happen. And, uh, hum and all that other stuff. Yes. Uh, so, uh, so that's kind of on the RF side. Uh, another did you know on the fiber side, um, APC, UPC, SPC, um, different fiber different connectors, types of, different types of fiber polished connectors. People used to, um, it, there was misnomers or about what that stood for angled physical contact, angled polished connector. I believe they're all polished connectors. Yes. I, I think APC really is angled physical contact. What is that angle? Do you know what that angle is? Uh, I did at one time. I don't, it, it, it's <laughs> not, was it five or 10 degrees or something like, like that? It's, it's supposed to be like eight. Yeah. It's like eight degrees, I believe. But uh, back in the day, you could have found some that might have been slightly off. What scares me is when, and what's the color code for the angle connector? I don't, I, I don't know. I know there's green connectors, there's blue yeah. connectors, there's yellow connectors. So green. So green would indicate that it's an angled connector. I mean, you don't want to grab a fiber and look at the end of it and blind yourself. <laughs> unless you know the other end's not plugged in anywhere. Uh, but you can usually see from the side there is an angle, but the green usually indicates it's angled. What scares me is when people have a bulkhead for connecting two fibers together. And you can't see what's on the other might, side. You don't know what's on the other side. Yeah. And the bulkhead or the, the adapter could be green. But it doesn't mean what's plugged on the other side is green. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, like, absolutely. You can, you can have a patch panel that has all these green connector, green adapters to plug two connectors in, but you don't know what someone plugged in the other side. That green on that adapter doesn't mean nothing. So the green on the fiber means something, but not on a little adapter thingy because it's just empty. So it's what happens if you together. plug in a a flat polish connector, a which I think is the UPC connector to a an angled polish connector that which I think is the APC connector. What happens if you plug them together, John? So here's what I've seen happen: is let's set it up and make sure everything works, and they screw it together, and it actually works. Then they unscrew it and they take it to a demo, and it doesn't work because yeah. every time they did that, the angle scraped up the other one. So they at the angle touching the flat one, and it's like, and they're screwing it together, and it screws up. Um, I mean, obviously you want two angles to come together. And if you don't put them in the adapter correctly, then you could have an angle like this and this instead of coming together because it should be keyed as well, right? Correct. The fiber, the two fibers need to come together as one. Um, but if you do a flat and an angle, it might work one time. It doesn't work the second time. Yeah, so because that's been my experience. I've gone into head ends where I've seen you know different colored fibers plugged together. I talked to the guy and he says, hey, it works. Um, but I think to your point over time, it you may have either more loss than what you need or what you anticipate, or yeah. over time you unplug, plug them back together and that starts to degrade. And now what you're doing is saying, wait, what happened to my signal level? And yeah. you're trying to troubleshoot, do I have a bad return path transmitter, a bad return path receiver, a bad fiber? I don't know. So now you start, you get into a situation where you're trying to troubleshoot something that had you just followed um, the best practices from the beginning, you wouldn't be in that troubleshooting scenario. Right. Well, and let's even go down the path of analog uh, fiber links and a digital fiber link and the difference in the fiber itself, like patch panels, multi-mode versus single mode. Multi-mode fiber is usually yellow, like the fiber is encased in yellow or orange. Sorry, I was backwards, orange. And then single mode is usually yellow. So single mode fiber. And we use single mode for RF transfer for our optical links, our AM links, amp amplitude modulated links. Uh, but multi-mode typically used for small patch panels of digital links. Digital is just on off, one zero, one zero, one zero, right? That's not what we do with analog with most of our RF plants is an analog uh, optical link. And we use single mode fiber, so it's usually yellow. Um, so understanding the color code for the connectors, understanding the color code of the fiber, uh, understanding SFPs, the share, shareable form factor, pluggable, SFP. Yeah. I'm... <laughs> it's the, the fiber optic transceivers and all that, right? Everything's built in now to these small little SFPs. Um, 
understanding the transmit and receive capabilities. So if I get a, a optical uh, transmitter and receiver, it's a pair, and it's rated for 80 kilometers, I'm not going to use it in a lab because I'm going to overload it because it's meant for 80 kilometers. Now, here's something a lot of people don't know. If I buy a, a 10 kilometer, a 40 kilometer, and an 80 kilometer transmitter, which one has the highest power? I would assume the 80 kilometer has the highest power. That's a trick question. And I talked to some of my optical guys, and I didn't realize this. It's the receiver sensitivity that makes the difference. Hmm. They're all the same power. No they kidding. They could all be 2 dBm. They could all be 2 dBm. Well, let's say 3 dBm, which would be 2 milliwatts, would be 3 dBm. So right? they all have, a, they all all have the exactly power. the same output. It's the receiver that has different sensitivity. But why do you have different power SFPs then? Or why, why are the SFPs rated at different distances? So because the receiver that goes with that one actually has more sensitivity to go with that transmitter. And it's a transceiver, right? It's usually transmit receiver. They're a pair. Receiver. They come in a pair. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the receiver part of that 80 kilometer transmitter, that has higher dynamic uh, range. Their sensitivity. Yeah. Yep. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, that one that one surprised me. I thought, well, it should have like it's not two dB. It's it should be a ten dBm or Correct. you know ten milliwatt laser or something. Yeah, because in the you know in the analog domain, that's exactly what exactly. we have. You have a higher. Yep. You have like a thirteen dBm fiber transmitter, a ten dBm five yep. dBm. Yep. They go in down. The analog amplitude modulated fiber links that we use. Yes, definitely different power levels. But on the digital side, uh, that's not the case. So Very interesting. I, I did not know that either. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's uh, I thought it's always interesting. Um, any more questions you want to go to before um, I share anything? Oh, Jason, Jason clarified our SFP small form factor pluggable. There Thank we you, go. Jason, for uh, helping <laughs> us there on that. Small form factor pluggable. Okay, yes, we Jason to many. the rescue. Thank you, Jason. We got too many. That's an initialism, right? Yes, if, it, if it's if we said swift, swift. Then it'll be an acronym. Yeah, can you do that one more time? <laughs> <I need to>... <laughs> <laughs> then, then it'll be an acronym, but we can't sound out SFP. No, so it's an initialism. initialism. Yes, Ron or, would be uh, so happy that we're getting these correct. Yeah, initialism and abbreviation, same thing. Uh, <laughs> we're, getting, we're getting everybody right right now. So oh, let my. me share, let me see if I can share um, a, screen sh a screenshot of a... Uh, spectrum analyzer graph. Right. I don't know if, if this pops up on the screen, if you can get this up on yep. the screen. It's up. All right. So I, I wanted to, I'm going to use you as the guinea pig. All right. So this is an upstream trace mm -hmm. and you can see with a max hold, things are starting to build up. So it's ATDMA, advanced time division, multiple access. The A at the end of ATDMA really means it's bursty, right? Right. So it's, uh, Advanced time division multiple access. So it's bursty. Downstream is not bursty. It's always on, but upstream is bursty. So what are we looking at on a spectrum analyzer when we see like this little, can you see my mouse moving? Yes. Yes, I can. Like what is this little sliver here versus this sliver here? And, so, and why, and, okay. So, and, and why does it not just burst up the whole channel width? So, so that's because uh, the spectrum analyzer is sweeping through with a narrow um, resolution filter. In this case, uh, well, I don't see the resolution. Oh, 300 kilohertz resolution <laughs> filter, right? And so we're just we're just kind of capturing little slices of that cable modem burst as we go through. That... Exactly. So there's a couple of things on a spectrum analyzer that will really kind of screw you up. I call it optical illusion. One, the sweep speed. How fast is it sweeping across? Like how long do I dwell at every single frequency? And what is dwelling? Like how wide is the filter? Well, that's dictated by you when you set the RBW. So your resolution bandwidth filter here is 300 kilohertz, which is pretty typical of the default. So that little filter is scanning across and grabbing energy and plotting it. So when I first got into Doxus modems, a lot of people thought what we were seeing here was this was one modem and this was a different modem. Right. I'm like, no, you're just picking up a, a 300 kilohertz amount of energy. If I made this resolution bandwidth filter, say 3.2 megahertz wide, you'd see the whole thing pop up. You just see one big hump. Yes, yes. And the whole thing would pop up. 
Yeah, and then no, totally the, the video bandwidth filter usually just creates more heavy filtering. So like if you see a really spiky noise floor, if you increase your BBW, you can kind of average the noise floor out and clean it up a little bit it's, to see it's, what's it's real. What the is. equivalent to video averaging. Yes. Yep. So understanding what you're seeing on a spectrum analyzer and knowing that even this reference level here is only reference to 300 kilohertz. So this power level of this upstream channel it's not going to, you can't get a good reading with a spectrum analyzer because it doesn't do digital average power. It's just grabbing the power of that 300 kilohertz. Yep. Now I can do an easy correction factor. I can say, well, this was a 3.2 megahertz wide channel. Out of the 3.2, the real symbol rate is like 2.56. So 3.2 megahertz wide channel, upstream channel. We're not using all 3.2, right? We're using 2.56 because we have what they call filter alpha and roll offs. If you, and I'm just going to round it off, say three megahertz. If they take three megahertz divided by 0.3 megahertz, that's going to be what? Uh, 10? 10. So 10 times the log of 10 is 10. <laughs> so my correction factor would be 10 dB. So if this reference level showed up as, where are we at? Minus 30 um, marker. I'm not even sure where I'm at. 10 dB per division. I would add 10 dB to whatever this reference level says. Right. As a correct factor to give me the total average power of a 3.2 megahertz wide channel. Yep. Yeah. Yes. You reference that. Same thing right? Yes. Yep. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense, John. Yeah, I I remember lots of times where uh, we would say, oh, I need I have an analog channel, video channel on the downstream, and I have a digital channel right beside it, and it should be off by 10 dB, and it's off by 20, and they're like, oh, I got to raise the level up. I'm like, no, you're trying to do an eyeball check on a spectrum analyzer that doesn't show power to power ratios. It's showing the peak power. Now the, the peak power of the video is right under the video carrier. So regardless of your res resolution bandwidth filter, you're going to capture it all anyway. Yes. But the digital channel is not showing all your power of the digital channel on a spectrum analyzer. Now so I'd need a correction factor. Now, many analyzers, so this is a swept spectrum analyzer. Many of the analyzers today are using analog to digital converters. How would that change this view if, if we're doing a sort of a snapshot with an analog to digital converter in modern analyzers that aren't sweeping through the spectrum? And that's where they, they were able to do like FFT, fast forward transforms, and grab all the power and then plot it for you, which is kind of nice. I mean, it, I think everything has its place, right? Uh, when I take my older spectrum analyzer and I can see the bursts coming up, I can also see impulse noise. Mm -hmm. I can also see ingress under the carrier. If I do an FFT of my DOCSIS carrier and it just plots the whole thing, how do I get to see what's underneath of it? Unless I have another graph of what's underneath my DOCSIS carrier. Right. So, um, right. so basically the, the A, A to D um, is it going to give you more information? Like, because it can give you the whole snapshot of the picture, right? It can give you the snapshot of the, the haystack. Yes. Right. So, so, I mean, in that regard, it can give you the total power because it's it's grabbing it all, and it can give you an average power because it's, it's doing the math itself, right? Mm -hmm. It can do the correction factor for you. Right. And and so I think that's I think with A to Ds you you gain some things but you also lose some things with with a swept spectrum um, spectrum analyzer you can ca you we kind of get that that screenshot that you saw where we we miss some things in the in the haystack but you can also yeah. capture some things kind of slowly set, uh, sweeping through and and I think you'll talk about zero span with yeah. an a analog to digital you can kind of capture haystacks. But because you're just capturing a screenshot, you're going to miss some data that you're, you're sweeping through unless you're really rapidly capturing screenshots. Um, so there's kind of a trade-off between the older analog spectrum analyzers and the newer A to D spectrum analyzers that we see out there. The, and, and if you really want to see a lot of impulse noise, slow down your sweep speed or increase the dwell time, whatever the terminology is. Different test vendors have different terminology. Uh, which means I'm going to take my filter, my RBW, my resolution bandwidth filter, and I'm going to dwell longer at each spot so I can capture impulse noise. Turn on peak hold, and you'll see it fill up from 5 to 15 megahertz. I mean, it'll, it'll be a lot nastier than what you think. Uh, if you keep a, a spectrum analyzer on a typical default of 20 millisecond sweep speed, uh, 
it goes so fast you probably miss it most of the time yep so it looks half decent so it, it's good sometimes to slow things down and put a peak hole to see if there's any junk in there and, and you can capture it a little bit better awesome so john we're we're just about a time is there anything um that you want to wrap up with. And I, I see Don, Don, if a tap has four SPI, I don't know if you were um, going to ask a question there, but please get it in before we wrap up here. Um, and then John, anything you want to, any, any last items you want to wrap up with? Um, let me, let me share uh, this PowerPoint. And I have a couple shots on here. At zero span. Let me slideshow current slide. You see that? Okay. So, you know, like when you have a spectrum analyzer and you can set the span, like 50 megahertz span, well, zero span means you're looking at the time domain. And what's nice about looking at the time domain of an upstream signal is you can see the burst, you can see the noise floor. So you can sort of do like a carrot to noise ratio, just kind of eyeballing it. Mm -hmm. um, but there can be times where you see signals that shouldn't even be there. And it turns out in zero span mode, you still have a filter grabbing that information. And if the filter is too big, like my resolution bandwidth filter here was um, two megahertz. Yep. That's a big filter. Huge. So if that filter was centered on a 3.2 megahertz wide channel, and then you had another adjacent channel, that filter is not gonna be a brick wall filter. It could have some roll off that actually captures the energy of a channel right beside the channel you think you're looking at. So in zero span mode, you could pick up what looks like ingress, but in reality, it's the next channel over, like right. the edge of it. You understand? Mm -hmm. uh, the other one I, I wrote down is, what if you have, um, so this is my test equipment center. If I want to see if it's picking up adjacent channel problems, I could turn off the adjacent channel, but you're not allowed to do that. Uh, maybe you change the resolution bandwidth filter so it's not so wide. And I go with a more narrow bandwidth filter, so I'm not capturing adjacent channel energy. And and these are settings. Uh, just just to go back, these are settings that you can change within. And, and this is like a handheld test meter that you're showing. These are all settings that a technician can modify and change in their in their test meter once they become accustomed to where these settings are. Right. So yes. before you were showing two megahertz, now you're showing 280 kilohertz in this meter. Yeah. So this one was 280 kilohertz. So I have a smaller filter. So I shouldn't be picking up adjacent channel as ingress. But what is this burst? When I see a burst really low in level, but it has width to it, like it's a real data burst. It's not ingress. Ingress would look more like a narrow spike. So that looks like real data. Uh, but well, why is it 10, 20, 30 dB down? Yeah, it looks like it maybe is noise or signal from maybe some other device that's interfering in the home or maybe even a neighbor's home. Correct. And in this case, it could have easily been port to port isolation in the head end. So you could have a CMTS for one fiber node, a CMTS for another fiber node, but then you have other equipment like sweep gear that's combining that information. Meaning this upstream channel could be 24 megahertz, this upstream channel is 24 megahertz, but it's two different nodes. So that's perfectly legit. But this 24 megahertz is going to find a path, port to port isolation and backfeed. Do you understand? Right. right. Yeah, so it's, it's, seeing, it's seeing a modem for, that's going for another CMTS because exactly. your head end combining is, has either been non-optimal or was somehow just messed up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You see how old this one was. This yeah, yeah. Well, that's you know, it's a reference to a, a, a anonymous CMTS vendor that is that no used longer to be around. Like, uh, uh, SCDMA stuff. Yeah. But you know, one way to make this port-to-port -port isolation look better was I put a pad on this common port. So if signal goes through and reflects off the front end of the it has to go through the pad twice. So that signal that happens to go this way it might get knocked down enough that it doesn't get seen. That modem will never have enough transmit power to actually get to the other CMTS because Correct. you added that pad. Correct. Makes total sense. Yeah, the other fix is get rid of this. <laughs> Just this, get rid of that combining network this, altogether because uh, well, it's, it's yeah, a bad the, design. The disparity in combining, right? It's like uh, if I do one-to-one -one combining, that's great. But what if some of the equipment isn't one-to-one? -one? And here is a case where I wanted two fiber nodes to go to this device. And it could have been reverse sweep equipment. Yep. Makes right? total sense.
All right, let me All right. stop sharing. We got uh, so so Don came in with the rest of his question. He says, if a tap has four spigots and one person always has connection issues, could another house cause issues from the tap as a tap like a splitter? Don, it's a great question. We did cover this in another episode. We we call this I think we call this a a neighbor near neighbor versus neighbor or something like that. I don't remember exactly what we called it. This absolutely happens where uh, if you have two neighbors off the same tap, particularly if it's a low value tap, uh, you really have pretty low isolation between the two neighbors that are off that same tap. Uh, even if it's a four port tap, that can be a, a low value tap. And just like you're saying about the splitters, if you think about a splitter in a house and maybe a modem is off of one port of the splitter and the other port, port of that splitter, if it's unterminated, or if it's going to a bunch of poor wiring with inside of that house, that can cause problems with a modem. Um, so either the splitter in the house or two customers off of the same tap, one customer can impact another. Absolutely, that can happen. And we call it uh, ADI, adjacent device interference. Yes. So uh, we, and we brought this up before, uh, a four port tap inside the tap is made up of a combination of splitters, like a, a multiple levels of splitters. So two ports side by side might be on the same internal splitter and there's not much isolation whereas if you took the neighbor off that one port and moved them over to the other port that might be its own separate splitter and those two splitters come together on a splitter so that creates a little bit better isolation so but you're not going to leave empty spigots just because you're trying to get better isolation but you kind of get the idea is the isolation port to port is dependent on which ports you're looking at absolutely all right, John, I think we wrapped everything up. Um, this was absolutely a fascinating and fun-filled discussion. Please like and hit the subscribe button if you enjoyed our conversation. We definitely hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. A huge thank you to um, our special guest, John Downey, for gracing us with his knowledge and expertise. And, of course, a shout-out to our amazing producer, Mia Collibreeze, for hurting all of us cats. If you enjoyed this video, Again, give us a thumbs up. Um, we will be back to um, in next Friday um, with Ron Rannick, uh, the legendary Ron Rannick. So mark your calendars, folks, because we'll be covering RF signal levels, and you won't want to miss that episode. Until then, just stay curious and uh, keep watching. So, so long, everyone. All right, take care.